Now, I should like to uh, talk about the question whether does, whether if something is scientifically random or is random in the way that science uh, talks about randomness, does that entail, therefore, that very thing is not guided by God or falls out of God's uh, sovereignty? Now, L. Plenninger, he has argued that there is no real conflict between the theory of evolution, properly understood, namely as a scientific theory, and Christian belief, properly understood. More specifically, he has argued that there is no real conflict between what I just call A and B, capital A and B. A says, God intended to create creatures of a certain kind, rational creatures with a moral sense and the capacity to know and love him and then acted in such a way as to accomplish this intention. That's A. And he says that's not in conflict with B, which says that the, which is the claim that the diversity of life has come to be by way of natural selection, winnowing, random genetic mutation. So his claim is that A and B are not in conflict with each other. And furthermore, Plenninger has argued that there is a real conflict between A, so the claim about God creating and, and intending uh, human beings uh, to be on earth, A is in conflict with C. C says the process, or is the claim that the process of evolution is unguided. No personal agent, not even God, has guided, directed, orchestrated, or shaped it. So A and B planning our claims are compatible, but A and C are incompatible. So whereas, whereas B is part of the scientific theory of evolution, Plenninger has argued that C is not. C is a philosophical add-on, a philosophical gloss on that theory. It's nothing inherently connected to uh, the scientific theory of evolution. Now let's call that Plantinga's claim, or I call Plantinga's claim, the claim that C is not part of the scientific theory of evolution. Now what I'd like to go through uh, this morning is whether these two things that I've been trying to point out are correct. Are A and B compatible? And is C indeed not a part of the scientific theory of evolution? Um, before I do that, however, I should like to make two things that I'm definitely not going to go into uh, this morning. Uh, and although the topic might suggest that I should go into it, uh, and I have no doubt that these are very important topics, they are simply not in my uh, line of business this morning. So my question, whether A and B are compatible, that is not the question whether A is true or whether B is true. I'm simply asking about a logical relationship between two claims. So I'm not going to, to argue that A is true, I'm not going to argue that B is true, I'm simply going to investigate into the logical relationships between these two claims, as well as to the relationship between A and uh, C, or actually I should say B and C. Another question I'm definitely not going into is whether, if you are to um, explain B, whether A is the explication of what B says. I'm not going into any explanatory relationships that might exist between uh, there being uh, creatures of a rational sort, so be, uh, human beings on the one hand, and whether their existence can only be uh, explained by reference to divine intention. Very important topic, but it's not on the menu for this morning. I'm only going to talk about the logical relationships between A and B and C. Is that important? Well, I think it is important. In the sort of environment that I usually work in, the theory of evolution is taken uh, for granted. Um, so for me, it is very important that you can be seriously about evolution and at the same time be, be serious about uh, creation. These two simply don't logically exclude one another. 
I'm not a biologist, so I cannot speak with any authority on the truth of the theory of evolution. But I can speak with some authority on the question whether or not, if evolutionary theory taken uh, in, the, in the sober way is true, whether that does entail that therefore God hasn't orchestrated or planned or intended human beings to exist. So that's the sort of thing that I can do as a philosopher. Now let's first think about A and B, whether they are compatible. Now it's widely felt that A and B are incompatible. Uh, I, can, I can give many references uh, for, that, uh, for that idea. Now one reason for thinking that A and B are incompatible has to do with randomness. A, the claim that God created human beings and intended human beings to exist in the world, uh, a, it is says, entails a proposition that's denied by B. A entails that creatures of a certain sort do not result from a process that involves randomness or chance. After all, A says that human beings are intended. Whereas B entails that human beings do result from uh, random processes. Hence, A and B are held to be incompatible. Now, let me say just a little word about incompatibility. So, I, I, I take it that one claim is incompatible with another claim, provided the one claim entails the denial of the other. They can't be both true at the same time. Um, So I'm not thinking, I mean, you, you could have weaker notions of, uh, of compatibility. You could say, well, one claim is incompatible with another claim, provided this claim is massively improbable given that claim. That's not the sort of compatibility I'm talking about. Now, I discuss, I'd like to discuss three responses to this sort of uh, argument. The biochemist uh, Dennis Alexander from Cambridge has argued that the argument is flawed due to not properly distinguishing between various senses of chance. An event can be a chance event, as he says, in the sense that one, it is predictable in principle, but not in practice. So flipping a coin may be a chance event in that particular sense. It may be as a matter of principle possible to predict the outcome of it, if you know all the initial conditions and the, the, the velocity with which my, the coin leaves my hand, the local conditions, the, 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 the currents, the, the hardness of the underground where the drop, where the, where the coin will drop, etc. Then in principle, you know, if I really knew all the circumstances, you know, I might be able to predict or I will be able to predict the outcome. Uh, well, as a matter of fact for most of us, well, for all of us, I should think, uh, it's a chance event in this first sense with, with the outcome of the flipping of the coin. There's a second sense in which an, an, uh, an event can be a chance or a random event. It can be uh, a random event in the sense that, or in a way that um, um, quantum mechanics speaks about random events. Those are events that are, in principle, unpredictable, not only impractical, given our cognitive limitations or doxastic limitations, they are in principle uh, unpredictable. Now finally, uh, Dennis Alexander says, an event can be a chance event in the sense that it has no real rhyme or reason, no intentionality. It's just a happenstance, no intentions behind it. Now, he says, that in some ultimate sense, the universe came to be by a chance event in sense three, that is a metaphysical statement. That has nothing to do with scientific claims to the effect, for instance, that mutations um, are the product of chance events in senses one and two. So what he's saying is, well, the scientific notion of chance or scientific notions of chance are either sense one or sense two on my handout. Number three, chance in the third sense, that's a metaphysical claim, has nothing to do with science. 
it may have to do with philosophy, but I'm not unhappy to say that philosophy simply isn't science. I hope it is well informed by science, or if good philosophy should be, uh, but doing philosophy simply is not the same as doing science. So what Alexander is saying then, in effect, is that A and B, or some relations, or some propositions that really are closely related to A and B, they are compatible in the sense that I've explained. Now this response on Alexander's part, important as it is, may leave one with a nagging worry. If, as Alexander says, only chance in the senses one and two are relevant to evolution, then this may mean, and this means, that certain events, perhaps those events leading up to mutations, are in principle unpredictable. Now, if they are unpredictable, they will also be unpredictable for an omniscient being. <coughs> and hence, they will also be unpredictable for God. Which raises the question whether it is even so much as possible that God uses chance processes or processes involving some element of randomness, whether, he can, whether, whether God can use uh, such processes as means to attain particular goals, especially the goal specified in claim A, that God intended to be uh, their human beings, rational beings uh, who are able to bear responsibility and the like. Now it's this particular question whether God can use chance that has been addressed by Peter van Inwagen, uh, an important philosopher, or actually a philosopher, a metaphysician, and philosopher of religion from the University of Notre Dame. So he has argued that Darwinism and design are fully compatible. His initial move is not unlike Alexander's move. He says the word chance can have very many different meanings. It has more than one sense. And in some of his senses, an event being a chance event is fully compatible with that event being deliberately intended, de deliberately brought about, intentionally chosen. Um, so to see this, we must notice that according to the Darwinian account of things, certain events, namely the occurrence of mutations, they are due to chance in a very specific sense. It's the Aristotelian sense of chance. So when Aristotle talked about chance, he meant there are events, complex events that happen, but uh, between the parts of the events there, are, there is no correlation and certainly no causality. So here are two, two examples. Shakespeare and Cervantes, they died on the same day. Not because the one killed the other, or they they, 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 uh, but still, they, they died on the same day. There was no relation, no correlation between the events whatsoever. It was just a happenstance that they died on the same day. Um, that's a no, it was just, was there a reason for that? Well, it was, it was a chance event. And on a more homelier scale, uh, I once was alone in our house when both the light, the electricity uh, uh, system stopped working, so all the lights went out, and at the very same time, no water was in the was in the sink anymore. It wasn't that the one occurred because of the other, or the other occurred because of the one. There were just two causal lines that were sort of crossing our house at the same time. Uh, there was no correlation between them whatsoever. That's the Aristotelian sense of chance. And what Van Inwagen uh, points out is that when Darwinists talk about chance events, they're talking about Aristotelian chance. I put, the, I put a, uh, a quotation from Peter Van Inwagen on the handout. 
So mutations do not occur in response to changes in the environmental perils or opportunities that confront individuals or species. There is, Darwinians insist, simply no correlation whatsoever between the usefulness to a particular species of a possible mutation, on the one hand, and the likelihood that that mutation will occur. Just an illustration of this. Suppose, um, suppose there is a, a species of toad, an important animal, and a species of toad is in a, in a dangerous environment. It's slowly dying out owing to some gradual changes in the environment. Now suppose now that three mutations in the genome of this animal are equally likely to occur from the perspective of molecular biology. One mutation would enable the species to cope with the, spe with the changing uh, environment. One would have no effect and another would be lethal. Right? Three, three mutations equally likely uh, with these three different effects. On one, uh, the latter one would be a lethal effect, the other would be a neutral, it would no effect, it would be a neutral mutation, and the other would give uh, great evolu ev evolutionary advantages. Uh, advantages uh, uh, on the, confer great evolutionary advantages on the organism. Now, if this, what I've been saying, is what absence of correlation means, and if this, in turn, is what it means for a mutation to be due to chance, well, then it can both be true that a mutation is due to chance, and that God has been guiding, or has been causing certain uh, mutations to occur. By, for instance, deliberately causing uh, certain events to happen uh, in the genome uh, of an exemplar of the species. From the perspective of molecular biology, there is nothing incompatible between the claim that a mutation is caused by God and the claim that there is no correspondence. No, I'm sorry, that there is no correlation between the likelihood that a mutation will occur and the usefulness of that, okay, of that uh, mutation. In other words, A and B are not incompatible with each other at all. They're fully compatible. Just to go on on the same line, uh, let's now turn to Plenninger himself. He has argued for the claim that A and B are compatible also. Not unlike Alexander and Van Inwagen, uh, he, he says that if we are going to discuss in a meaningful way the question whether A and B are compatible, we should be fully clear <coughs> about what randomness or what chanciness means, to what property it refers. Now, Plenega cites two undisputed authorities uh, in evolutionary uh, biology on the notion of randomness and chanciness. Uh, I put them on the handout. Um, although I think I forgot to mention that the first quotation is by Ernst Meyer. So the, uh, Ernst Meyer says, when it is said that a mutation or variation is random, the statement simply means that there is no correlation between the production of a new genotype and the adaptational needs of an organism in a given environment. There is no correlation between them. Just as in the Shakespeare uh, Cervantes case. And Elliot Sober says, there is no physical mechanism, either inside the organisms or outside of them, that detects which mutations would be beneficial and causes those muta mutations to occur. Again, it's the absence of a particular sort of correlation. That's what it means for a mutation to be a chance event. Now, Plantica remarks, rightly so, that if mutations are random in this sense, then it's clear that mutations, uh, that the occurrence of mutations uh, is fully compatible 
with these mutations being caused by God. There's simply no logical uh, problem whatsoever. So I hope what I've been able to show so far that, that the claim that A and B are compatible, just purely logically speaking, that's a claim that can be sustained. There's nothing irregular in saying that. Now I'd like to go on to go to specific Plantinga's claim. So Plantinga claims that C is not a part of the theory of evolution. So recall, C is the claim that the process of evolution is unguided. No personal agent, not even God, has guided, directed, orchestrated, or shaped it. What Plantinga is claiming is that this thing, this C, is not a part of the theory, the scientific theory of evolution. Um, now, what does it mean for a certain claim to be a part of a certain theory or not to be part of a certain theory? Uh, well, let's think about that for a moment. If we think of a theory T as a set of propositions, P1, P2, P3, etc., then we may say that a certain proposition is part of the theory provided P is a set of that particular, is an element of that particular set that I've mentioned. Now, if we are to apply this to the scientific theory of evolution, we must first decide which propositions jointly constitute the, the, the theory of evolution. Well, relevant here are such propositions as the following, that the Earth is some 4.5 billion years old, that life has progressed from relatively simple to relatively complex forms of life, and not the other way around, that there is descent with modification, offspring differ in small respects uh, from their parents, and there is the claim that all forms of life have a common ancestry, and there is the claim that the process of descent with modification is driven by a particular mechanism, or mechanism, for instance, natural selection. These are the sorts of claims that jointly constitute the theory of evolution. Now, here's a question, are, are all these claims actually part of the theory of evolution? Well, it would seem that, except for one that I mentioned, all of them seem to be part of the theory, the theory of evolution. Um, so, except, so I said that the, that the, that the Earth is very, very old, 4.5 billion years, right? That's the current estimation. That's not a claim that's, I don't think so, I don't think that's, that's a claim that's part of the theory, uh, um, the scientific theory of evolution. It's a presupposition of the scientific theory of evolution. So there are claims that are related to the theory, theory of evolution, without being part of the theory of evolution. There are presuppositions. They're presupposed by that theory. So the part, so I'm just trying to think about what does it mean to, for a claim to be a part of a theory? And I'm distinguishing the part of relationship from, in this case, the presupposition type of relationship that, that a proposition can have to a particular theory. Um, now, the part of relation in which propositions can stand to a theory must also be distinguished from the relations of entailment. Theories entail certain things, but it isn't the case that all the entailments are part of the theory. Here's an example. The proposition Venus and Mars attract each other is entailed by Newton's theory of gravitation in conjunction with other propositions, but it is not a part of that theory. Right? Newton's theory of gravitation entails that, uh, but it isn't part of the theory. Um, another, another, and the part of relationship, so should be distinguished from the relationship of presupposition, it should be uh, distinguished from an entailment, and it should also be distinguished from 
sort of a loose association with. So it frequently happens that people associate propositions with a theory even though these propositions are neither part of, nor presupposed, nor entailed by the theory. For instance, the proposition that capitalism must structure social life has been associated with the theory of evolution. Right? Social Darwinists uh, have claimed uh, such things. But this is neither a part of, nor uh, neither part of the uh, theory of evolution, nor is it presupposed by it, nor is it entailed by it, I don't think. Now, given these explications, we can now put Plantinga's claim as follows. C is not part of the theory of evolution, nor is it presupposed by it, nor is it entailed by it. What is it then? Well, it's just a loose association. Many people like to think about the theory of evolution in conjunction with C. But there's no logical or epistemological necessity whatsoever to do so. Now let's now think just for a minute, how do some experts, or people who claim to be experts in this field, like Richard Dawkins, uh, how does he argue that C is in fact part of the theory of evolution? Well, I think Plantinga has a really interesting uh, uh, number of things to say about this. So it should be noted, first of all, that although Dawkins claims to argue that the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design, what he in fact is arguing is something different. What he is arguing is this. It's not astronomically improbable that the living world was produced by unguided evolution, and hence is without design. So what he's saying is, it's not astronomically improbable that life on Earth is, is the product of unguided evolution. It's not astronomically improbable. Well, think about this. How can you get from the claim, it's not astronomically improbable that life on Earth came about or, or, or is unguided to, hence it is unguided. It's like, you know, it's not astronomically improbable that I'll get a, a, a raise of my salary in the next 10 years. To, have, or it's not, oh no, I should put it a little different. It's not astronomically improbable that I'll get a, a salary raise next year. Therefore, I will get a, a salary raise next year. It's not astronomically improbable that, um, let's say, the Wolverhampton Rovers will win the Champions League within five years. Not astronomically improbable, hence they will win. I mean, that's a lousy argument. If you, if you carefully go through Dawkins' argument, it's really an argument of this sort. And I think that no one should be impressed by that. No one should be impressed by that. Um, so this leads us to conclude, or it leaves me to conclude, that C is neither presupposed nor entailed by the science of evolution. There's no scientific argument <coughs> from the facts of evolution to the conclusion that C. But if C isn't supported by the facts of evolution, then how does C relate to the theory of evolution? Well, here you can understand, it's, an, it's, a, it's a philosophical gloss. It's an inessential thing. It does no work. Many people believe it. It works in their lives. It works in our culture. But for the theory of evolution, it does nothing. It's just an idle wheel. Um, okay, I have a couple more things to say about it, but I think I'll leave it uh, for now. Um, so the, the bottom line of what I've been trying to say is, if we think about the logical uh, relationship between these two claims, A and B, God intended human beings to be on Earth and intentionally brought their existence about, and 
um, life on Earth has um, progressed in a way that current evolutionary theory draws our attention to by means of uh, processes like uh, natural selection that involves a certain element of uh, chanciness. These two claims simply are not incompatible. That was the first point. The second point is the claim that C, so the unguidedness of uh, the evolutionary process, is part of the theory, the scientific theory of evolution, that's just wrong. That isn't part of the theory of evolution properly understood. And I can say, so I, I talked this over with Elliot Sober uh, when he was in Amsterdam, and he sort of changed over his mind. He said, I do agree that Christians, they can, they can, be, they can continue be, uh, believing in, uh, uh, in divine creation through evolution. There is no logical problem whatsoever. Uh, there are a couple of uh, additional things uh, he added to that, uh, but he sort of um, backed off from certain extreme claims that he made in the past. Uh, so I have it. So this is actually uh, much more of, of this is in, is in a paper that I published last year uh, in the philosophy journal that I like, Ratio. Um, so it, I put it on the handout as well, so if you like to read it, you can retrieve it from uh, from the website from the website of the of the journal. So these were the two things that I was trying to say. <laughs>